the song we're about to sing is a commitment song, a song of commitment. Matthew 16, 24 says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and follow me. We heard that in the message this morning. Very clear, we make decisions. And wouldn't that be the greatest decision we ever met, made? It was to get closer to the Lord, be more like Christ. And you have to do something to get there. You have to surrender all. So we're going to stand. We'll sing four verses. I know this is a slow song. We'll tend to just move right along. Here we go. All to Jesus I surrender to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence day. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed. Blessed Savior, I surrender. Listen, listen to this next verse. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasure, all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. Let's sing it. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Make this your prayer. Here it is. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. That third verse, all to Jesus I surrender. May we save your holy mind. Let me feel the Holy Spirit truly know that thou art I surrender all. I surrender. My blessed Savior, I surrender. On that last verse, all to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let my blessings fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Pastor. Amen. While you remain standing, we'll pray. But just before we do, for, of course, we want to welcome you. But it's not just the missionary that needs to surrender all. Tonight, you'll hear from a couple. You'll hear from Robert and Debbie Keaton, who will give you a little, just a little background where they've come from, what God's doing currently in their life, perhaps where they hope to see God take them, where God's laid a burden upon their heart. But the Keatons surrendered all. I remember when they parked out here before this building or that building was built, and they parked out there, noise from the daycare that we had and the little finched in red and white building. But I don't want to take all your time. All I know is I remember when in those little cramped corners, now their daughter who lives in Africa, a missionary there with, well, she may be stateside now, of course, but uh, regardless, just for a short furlough, but Tanya and, um, and Brian would be out there and they'd be homeschooled by Debbie lots of times like that. And it's because they surrendered all. Tonight, I challenge you, listen 
to God speak, and perhaps he may be speaking to you as he did Glenn some years later, as he did Brother uh, Douglas, who came to a saving knowledge of the Lord under the preaching. Uh, how many think that you could classify Brother Douglas as a mule-headed person? No, I mean a mule-headed <laughs> church member. A mule-headed church member. I got it right now. Mule okay, I get no followers, no takers. But he got saved under a message that was preached by somebody that surrendered all impacting another life. Yeah. Your life this year should impact somebody else's life. Yeah. Fathers, we pray. We pray that tonight you'll do a work and put fire in our bones. We thank you that we can sing a song that's a little bit, maybe it, it's reflective, and yet it's declarative. We, ah, it's personal. It has to do with the matter of the heart. I surrender. Not just... Just what I feel I can let go, but I give my all to Jesus. Pray that tonight will be a message that will be memorable for many. Not just, we thank the Lord so much for the Douglas family coming back here to minister with us. And we thank you for the great preaching we heard this morning. But it's because someone surrendered all that another surrendered all. It takes a life of Christ to change any of us, but then our lives will be used of you to change someone else's. Bless tonight, we pray, and we ask that you uh, accept our thanks for all that you've done this year past, and we look forward to a continuation of your provision and protection that you've promised. We pray this in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Thank you. We're going to sing this next song. It's a song of testimony. I know you all know it. Love lifted me. I can testify that when I asked the Lord in my heart, that old jail cell, man, he changed my life forever. And you know, I could have been behind those bars, but really it's the bondage. You don't need to be behind a, a jail cell. And you're out in the world held down by bondage. If you don't know the Lord is your personal Savior, tonight's the night, if you allow it to happen. Love lifted me. Great song. Here we go. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deep we stayed within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despair. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give. In His blessed presence, live. ever His praise is seen. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs. Faithful loving service to Him belong. Sing it out. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, me on that last verse, souls and dangers look. <clears throat> he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. He's be saved today. Love lifted me. Me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. What's some good singing? We got a special brother, Darren Shire, is going to come and sing a special for you. And then the pastor introduce uh, Robert or Robert to come up after that. I 
I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. I believe that this life with its great mystery surely someday will come to an end. Oh, but faith will conquer the darkness and death and will lead me at last to my friend. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. I believe that this Christ who was slain on the cross has the power to change lives today. For he changed me completely, a new life is mine. That is why by the cross I will stand. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. Amen. Amen. Preacher asked me to introduce our speaker, and uh, I'm very surprised he would let me back up here after the comments he made. <laughs> But I will not retaliate. I'm going to take the high road, Brother Glenn. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, it is a great privilege to have Brother Keen with us. And the night I got saved, several others got saved in our church that night. And uh, it made a tremendous difference in our life. And uh, I'm so thankful for his ministry, uh, Rock of Ages ministry. Um, they've impacted my life, not just Brother Robert, Brother Glenn, many other uh, missionaries from Rock of Ages uh, that I have uh, had the privilege of knowing and hearing. And uh, I can tell you this, uh, the, the group with Rock of Ages, they've got some great preachers going into these prisons. And uh, God has uh, given them great amount of fruit for their labor. And uh, we look forward to hearing from what's going to come in the future. And also Brother Keaton and I. Brother Keaton, would you come? Amen. brother. Amen. It's good to be with you tonight, amen. I count it a privilege and an honor anytime God lets us share His Word and share His work, amen. It's all His anyway, amen. Uh, but God's been so good to us uh, there at the Rock of Ages and what He's allowed us to see done and accomplished. And uh, we've got to give Him all the glory and the honor for it. Uh, the main thing that Debbie and I do nowadays is mail Bible lessons in, amen. Uh, right, the last mail them, print them, and things of that nature. Uh, but we have somewhere around just over 14,000 students uh, in prison studying the Word of God around the world. Amen. And uh, so uh, with that said, uh, this past year, just January through November, I don't have December's figures in yet, uh, but there's been 1,160 that have written in and said we got saved doing the Bible studies. And uh, that Bible says in Romans chapter, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 7, 
and pain so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God amen and so we know it's his word that gets it accomplished it's sure not us I'll be the mailman all day long amen for that kind of results uh, but God's been so good to us in that uh, we for 11 and a half years we lived in that trailer the preacher was talking about parked out here at the side and uh, with our house being mobile and everything and then God settled us down in Cleveland Tennessee uh, to start training other missionaries and uh, then from that we went into uh, working overseas for a while and uh, making trips overseas and training nationals in other countries uh, then God allowed us to take over uh, in 2006 our Bible college that's all external studies and we run about 60 students in that now at one time we got up to about 270 uh, college students uh, and that's a payable college and all the funds for that go into the ministry to help fund stuff for the inmates to get the gospel amen and uh, get uh, the people in our churches a good Bible education and then in 2009 is when we took over the Discipleship Institute uh, mailing lessons into the prisoners and uh, so that's been a very rewarding uh, ministry there that part of it uh, back in I'm trying to think about June or July, uh, the number of lessons that we had returned uh, since that department started, lessons returned and graded hit just over one and a quarter million uh, lessons that had been graded, amen? And uh, you say, preacher, that, that's a lot of lessons. It sure is. And we do it with volunteer help, helping us grade the lessons and things of that nature. Uh, but we all total, there has been close to 60,000 uh, in the last 25 years that have written in and said we got saved doing these Bible studies. Amen. So great investment uh, into the ministry there. Uh, our postage runs us about twelve to $1,400 a week. Uh, but if you figure the return on it, that's a pretty good investment on souls. Amen. And so God's been mighty good to us there. I uh, had uh, just give you, uh, I don't know how our letters get posted or put up. Uh, about six months ago, I guess it was now, five, six months ago, an inmate wrote in and he said, I've been communicating with my 16 year old daughter. And he said, uh, over the phone, he's been making calls to her and talking to her. And he said, uh, I uh, wrote to her or calling her and talking to her and asked her if she had a Bible. And she said she did. And I said, I told her to go and get a good King James Bible. And she said, the next conversation I asked her and she had gotten her Bible. And he said, are you reading it every day? And she said, yes, I am. And she continued on a few more phone conversations. And he said, well, have you, have you asked Christ to forgive you and save you yet? And she said, I really don't quite know how. He said, go get your Bible. And over the phone, he got to leave brother on he got to lead his daughter 16 years old to the lord on father's day and he said what a father's day gift i had getting to lead my 16 year old daughter to the lord he said i wrote and told you all of this to ask this will you enroll her in your bible studies and he said don't worry about trying to explain them to her i'll take care of that part of it <laughs> one of our students amen uh, had another inmate that wrote in just to show you some of the fruit of what you've been investing in amen uh, Another inmate wrote in, this has probably been a year or more ago now, and he said, uh, I want to thank you for the lesson on repentance. He said, I thought I knew what repentance was. He said, but now I do, and I did. And so what he was saying was he got saved as a result of the lesson. And so he asked the Lord to forgive him and save him. But he said, more than that, he said, my father was dying of cancer. And he said, through my correspondence with my father, because I found out what true repentance was, he said, my father is in heaven now because of that lesson. And so he got to win his father to the Lord. Amen. Uh, so it's not just the souls that we see saved that write in and tell us that they got saved during the lesson, but it's uh, those that are getting saved are winning others to Christ as well. And, and so we praise the Lord for that. Just That's just God's goodness. Amen. And so we thank the Lord for that. Uh, preacher, I don't know if you know how long the church has been supporting us, uh, but since November of 1989, 
Shelton Beach Road Baptist Church has been supporting our family. Uh, that's about 35 years, if my math does right. Uh, April, we'll start year 30, 38 uh, with the ministry. And uh, it just seems like the other day, the only thing that has changed on our prayer cards is I've started parting my hair on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> that's about the thing that's changed, amen, uh, or for the last few prayer cards anyway. The very early one, somebody came up to me this morning and said, I've got your very first prayer card when you came to our church the first time over in the old building. And that would have been in 1989. I had hair then. If you don't believe it, find him and look at the prayer card, amen. Uh, but God has been so good to us, amen. Thank you so much, church, for uh, all that you've done for us through the years, amen. We cannot do the work that we do without churches and church members like you. And so we thank you so much. Uh, I miss the days of seeing your preacher in prison. <laughs> So I know some of y'all are looking forward to that day, but I mean, no, it, uh, he used to go to prison with me some, amen, and uh, we, we always brought him back out, but uh, those are some good days back then, amen. I uh, got to say some good numbers of souls saved, lives changed, and uh, I can't tell you how much, uh, what a blessing it is when you preach and see God get a hold of their hearts, amen, and you know it's real, and you go back in six months or a year, and they're still sticking with the stuff. Amen. Uh, it just means so much. It's such a blessing. Amen. And so do pray for those that get saved in the prisons, uh, those that have families in the prisons, uh, because a lot of times those in the prison, when they get saved, are witnessing to the family on the outside. Amen. And so it's reaching more than just the one that's incarcerated. And so we praise the Lord for all that he's allowed us to do. Thank you so much for your, uh, your support again and for your love and your prayers for us. Amen. Uh, we know that it's through the prayers of God's people that we're enabled to do the work that God has us to do. Amen. Uh, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And uh, we know it's because of God's people praying, but Sammy holding us up before the Lord. Amen. Um, and so thank you so much for that. Uh, if you got your Bibles with you tonight, open with me to the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 21. <laughs> Numbers chapter 21. And I want to share a message with you tonight that uh, um, I'm going to give you the title of it, but the title won't make much sense until we get to the last point. But it will come together, I promise. Uh, I want to preach tonight on this thought on do you have a brazen serpent that you need to get rid of? Do you have a brazen serpent that you need to get rid of? In Numbers chapter 21, if you would, uh, I'm going to pray and then we'll read the passage. Father, we come to you and Lord, ask your blessing upon your word. I pray that God you would take and speak to our hearts through it. Pray that God you would, Lord, just give me clarity of thought and of speech tonight. Father, help me to convey to your people, Lord, what you put upon my heart. Help me to be a help and a blessing to them. I pray that God you would just, uh, Lord, meet with us. Lord, you Use your word tonight in our hearts. Have, uh, Lord, free course in our hearts, Lord. I pray that, God, you'd work according to your will. And we'll praise you and we'll thank you for everything that you do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. In Numbers chapter 21, beginning in verse 1 down through verse 9, it says, And when King Arad the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their cities, and he called the name of the place Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents uh, from us. And Moses prayed for the people. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And so I want to look at this passage of Scripture and just point out just a few things out of this passage. But uh, the thought tonight, do you have a brazen serpent that you need to get rid of? And again, that'll make sense when we get to the end of it. But I want you to notice just a few things as we come down through this. First thing I want to point out to you is found in verse 4. It said, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to compass uh, the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Uh, I don't know about you, but these last few years of COVID and all that's been going on in our nation uh, with uh, the political scene and everything else, the economy and everything, I don't know about you, but I've had to battle some discouragement these last few years, amen, when seeing what COVID has done in our churches, when we, we see attendance down, when we see people that used to be there that are not back in church, I mean, even after things open back up, they've not come back, they've not gone anywhere, they're just out of church, amen, and so there's a lot of that going on, but the people became much discouraged because of the way. That's something we've got to realize, and I'm not, I know you know this, it's nothing new to you, but uh, God is in control. <laughs> Even when it seems chaotic, even when it seems like nothing's going right, even when it seems like our world is turning upside down, when it seems like our economy's falling apart, our military is not what it used to be, we see so much that's happening in our world today, and it's easy to get discouraged because of the way that things are going. But we've got to keep in mind, we've got to be looking onto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. He's the one that's in control. He's still in charge. Amen. It's not taking him by surprise. He knows exactly exactly what's going on. He knows exactly where we are, what we're going through. He knows the difficulties that we face. Amen. He knew the children of Israel right where they were. Amen. And yet they got discouraged because of the way. Amen. The Bible says it's going to rain on the just and the unjust alike. Amen. And just because I got saved doesn't mean there's not going to be any difficult times. Just because I got saved doesn't mean everything's going to be smooth sailing. Just because I got saved doesn't mean that God's going to take care of all my enemies. Amen. It means that there's going to be uh, uh, the Lord knowing where I'm at and the Lord taking care of and the Lord shielding when I need shielding and the Lord strengthening when I need strengthening the Lord encouraging when I need encouragement if I keep my eyes on the Lord through it all but it's awfully easy when the way comes and it gets discouraging to allow discouragement to creep in I notice what the children of Israel and the people spake against God Preacher, you would never speak against God. But there's a lot of times we think against Him. We say, Lord, why? <laughs> Lord, what's... Oh, we, we, we may not go to gym, we may not say it. We may not say it out loud, but in our hearts a lot of times, like you was talking about this morning, this old flesh is still very much alive in you and I today. And when the troubles don't go, when the troubles go against us, I mean, when the troubles seem to overwhelm us, it's awfully easy for us to kind of murmur in our hearts. <laughs> against God because of what we're going through. Lord, don't you know that I'm serving you? Lord, don't you know that we've sacrificed? Lord, don't you know that we've left all? And God knows all of that. Amen. And who are we that we should expect anything better? I know preachers, where we're so bad about saying, no, I deserve to be in hell with my back broke. I don't know what your back broke in hell has to do. I mean, hell is hell. It doesn't matter what shape you're in. Amen. <laughs> I, I, I doubt if your back was broken, you was in hell, it, it, you'd even notice your back, amen, because of the flames and the, the fire that's not quenching the worm that dieth not, amen. It doesn't matter what all your ailments are, but we try to dramatize it a little bit, amen. And the thing that, that I'm trying to get across is difficult times are going to come, amen. And when they do, we need to realize he still knows where we are. Yeah. He's still in control. He's not going to lose control. Amen. Greater is he that is in us. If you're saved tonight, we're on the winning side. Let's act like it. Amen. Let's lift our heads up. Amen. Let's praise him. Uh, the Bible said in everything give thanks. I mean, somebody just rammed you in the side with their vehicle. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You say, preacher, you're crazy. Well, I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> I still get to torment some of you. No, I, God is good. 
It doesn't matter what we go through. He's still good. He can't be anything but good to his children. Amen. I shared, said this the other day in a church. I, I said, no, a lot of you have said, and I, I hear people start to talk all the time about, my dad always said, this is going to hurt you more than it does me. I never heard those words. My dad always intended for it to hurt me more than it did him. <laughs> But I got a father in heaven that he never intends it to hurt me more than it does him. You realize it breaks his heart to chasten us? You realize it breaks his heart to have to correct us when he has done everything that we need, every, every possibility is given to us to live a fruitful and a productive life, a life that will honor and please him. We've got everything at our disposal to do so. And it breaks his heart when we don't use prayer, faith, his word. The people were much discouraged because of the way. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Preacher, now, I, 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 we've been hanging around this crowd for a long time, too. And you don't have anybody that's ever spoke ill against you. Uh, Wait, let's go to the altar together, okay? <laughs> You pastored over family. You never had nobody ever speak evil against you. I'm joking, okay? But how many have you had speak evil against you? In all seriousness. And when trouble comes, they leave. They speak evil, they murmur against, they complain, and they depart. And then trouble comes. If you had them call you... You've had them call you. Preacher, pray for us. And I know both of you probably both said, just forget you, Slick. <laughs> no, that's not what you did. You prayed for him. That's what Moses did. They murmured against Moses. They confessed it. They acknowledged what they had done to Moses because of the discouragement, because of the way. And Moses prayed for him. God told him to make a brazen serpent, put it upon a pole, that they could have a remedy for their situation. The people were much discouraged because of the way. Notice Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall also reap if you faint not. Second Thessalonians 3 and 13, But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. James chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Amen. We've got to keep this in mind. Amen. Because if we don't, the old devil's going to have us murmuring and complaining because of our circumstance. And that's not God's will. We see, the, we see what happens when that takes place. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. Amen. When you're going through the trial, you're not the only one going through. Amen. Troubles. I want you to see the consequences of their murmuring. They're discouraged because of the way, but we see destruction follows. Numbers chapter 21, verse 6 and 7, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 16, notice what the Word of God says, In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou may live and multiply and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou go, goest to possess it. Amen. God tells us how to walk, how to do, amen, how to behave, how to respond. Amen. It's when this old flesh rises up that we don't respond the way that God intends for us to. Hosea chapter 4 verses 6 through verse 7 most of us could quote the first part of it. 
My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Can anybody quote the rest of it? So Jimmy, I read this one day and it, it ate my lunch. It said, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I also will forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, I will change their glory into shame. For the shock of God challenged my heart that day and showed me that my children's going to reap what I sow. The sins of the fathers are visited under the third and fourth generation. If I don't study to show myself approved unto God, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because if I don't, Brother Glenn, I don't walk in the knowledge of the Lord, amen, it's going to have repercussion unto my children and my children's children unto the third and fourth generations. We need to stay in God's Word as God's children. Amen. Staying in His Word will keep us from getting discouraged in the way. Amen. Keeping in His Word will keep us from facing the destruction that's going to follow. Amen. We see in Hosea chapter 14 and verse 9, Who is wise, and he shall understand these things prudent, he shall know them, for the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressor shall fall therein. Haggai hey, yeah, chapter 1 and verses 5 through verse 7 it says, Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Notice what he says. You have sown much, but you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink ye, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe ye, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Twice God makes that statement in those three verses. Consider your ways. Amen. When we're going through difficulties, when we're going through times when, when destruction seems to be following. Amen. We need to st stop and take inventory of where my walk is with the Lord. Now, not every time that we go through trouble is because my walk is not right. It's not. Not every illness is because I'm distant to God. Sometimes the things come that God can build our faith. Amen. But sometimes we need to examine to see if I'm pleasing in His sight. Hebrews 3 and 10, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and have not known my ways. Hey, children, child of God, we are to know that God's ways, the Bible said, yea, and all that will live godly shall suffer persecution. So when troubles come and persecutions come, why should we not faith? Why should we not expect some repercussions? Why should we not expect some difficult times? It rains on the just and the unjust alike. I mean, when, they, when the economy goes south, amen, it affects all of us. When, when, when hard times come, when COVID came, it affected all of us, Christians and non-Christians alike. Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever he soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sow to the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if he sow to the Spirit, he shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. I want you to notice now a deliverance. We see the discouragement because of the way. We see the destruction that follows. But thank God for the deliverance that was provided. <laughs> That's God to His people. The old devil don't do that for his, amen. I remember lost, lost till the age of 27, and the old devil never said no deliverance my way. It wasn't until I got saved, amen, got, got delivered by the deliverer, amen, that deliverance came in my life. The deliverance that was provided, notice in Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, put it, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bidden when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon on a pole and it came to pass it that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent, he lived. Now there's a song that we sing look and live. Y'all sing that around here sometimes? Look and live, my brother live, look to Jesus Christ and live. 
Amen. Now the, the thing was, this circle was, it was not to be worshipped. Amen. It was not to be bowed down to. It didn't say they bowed down. It said when they got bit, they looked, they lived. Amen. If we'll look to Jesus Christ, we live. Amen. Look to Jesus Christ. He is our hope. Amen. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice in, in John chapter 3, and verse 14 and 16, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have a, a, a everlasting life. We know that, that that is just a picture when Moses. Moses did that. It was a picture, as a foreshadowing of what was going to be done on Calvary. Amen. But I don't worship that cross. I worship the one that died on that cross. That cross has no magical powers. That, that, that cross, I mean, we don't go to the movies and watch a ward off vampires with it. I mean... It's just to remind me of who died and loved me more than anybody's ever died for me, anybody's ever loved me, anybody's ever cared for me. It reminds me of what I was and what, how it changed when I looked and lived. Amen. He's not still there. He's, I, I praise God for the empty tomb, but I don't worship the empty tomb. He's not there. I, I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. Amen. I know who I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. Amen. I've got to keep my focus right. Amen. Because when, when that deliverance is provided, amen, so many people in religion have got it misconstrued. They're looking to the wrong things, hoping in it. Amen. And there's only one thing our hope should be in, and that is Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen to this verse. Ezra 9 and verse 13. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such a deliverance as this. I don't know about you, but I've never got over what God did on December the 10th, 1981. 11.30 on a Thursday night. I don't know if I've ever shared this here or not. We joined the church the Sunday before. <laughs> a little backwards. Everybody always said I was backwards country boy, you know, back, kind of backwards growing up. I really did things backward that day. I, I joined the church Sunday, got saved on Thursday following. My pastor gave me a book to Debbie and I that was printed by Rock of Ages Prison Ministry. <laughs> It's called, I Just Got Saved, What's Next? And Brother Glenn, going through that book, he said, we met with him on Sunday afternoon. After we went forward on Sunday morning, he said, it do you and your wife good since you've been out of church for a while uh, to go through a chapter of this each night. And on Thursday night, we was going through the chapter on the transition that took place when you asked God to forgive you and to save you. And uh, up until that time, we'd been married eight years at that point. And... Uh, We'd go to church. I'd come under conviction. I'd go forward. I'd rededicate my life. I'd get up and do good for a day or two and be right back to my old ways. That Thursday night on December the 10th, 1981, I came under conviction again. I told Debbie, I said, I'm going to read some of these verses again. She said, well, I'm tired. I'm going on to bed. She'd gotten saved about two or three years before this. I kept us out saying, if you're saved, you don't have to be in church all the time. I start going through the scriptures and God convicted me. I bowed my head standing in the corner of our kitchen behind our table and I said, God, I'm sick and tired of how I've been living. And I said, God, I want to rededicate my life. And I didn't hear an audible voice, but God spoke to my heart. You know what I'm talking about. And I looked to the side to see who was there, but it wasn't nobody there. But God in my heart, Brother Glenn, said, how can you rededicate what you never dedicated? 
And for the first time at the age of 27, I realized I was a sinner on my way to hell. He's punished us less than our iniquities deserve. And I prayed and I asked God to forgive me and to save me that night. Most of my family said it ruined me. If this is ruined, I love being ruined. Amen. God is so good. Psalms 32, verse 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. That Selah means to think on, to meditate upon, to not forget it, to keep running it over and over in your mind. One of our North Carolina preachers that's home with the Lord now, I liked his... Brother Ron, his translation or interpretation of that, he said that word Selah just means what about that? You read what God has said and you sit back and just say, man, what about that? That's the God I serve. That's the God that loves me. That's the God that I love tonight. I want you to notice something to, that, that we see the, the discouragement, we see the destruction, we see the deliverance that's provided. But I want you to notice that we need some discernment. There's discernment that is needed. It's needed in our church today. It's needed in our independent, fundamental Baptist churches today. Something discernment, preacher, something that's fleeting from a lot of Christianity today. But there needs to be a discernment. Uh, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, it says, Thou shalt make, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. God tells us pretty plain that we're not to make images. Amen? That sounds Sounds like a contradiction to what Moses was told to do there in the wilderness, but it's not. Follow with me. God's word will always clarify itself. God's word is, excuse me, is the best dictionary that you can get on the word of God. Amen. It's it can explain. It will explain itself better than any other book can ever explain it. Notice in Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 1. You shall, not, you shall make you no idols or graven image, neither rear up a standing image, neither shall you set up an image of stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. So it clarifies real clearly that it, you make the image, it's not to be bowed down to. When Moses made the brazen serpent, put it upon a pole, it was to look at when you got bit. If you didn't get bit, you didn't need it. Amen. And so it was a picture of, of, of taking care of the bite of the serpent. Amen. And so, and, and see, the thing of it is, you don't look to Christ till you realize you're bit. That little kid don't realize it, amen, that, until they're of that age of accountability. They have no need to look to Jesus and live, amen. But it's when they come to the age of accountability that now they know they've been bit, amen. The serpent has made it aware. They know sin. Now it's time to look and live. Discernment's got to be there. Exodus 32, verses 3 through verse 6. And the people break off the golden earrings. That which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron, and he received them in their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he'd made it a golden calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron built, when he saw it, built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down uh, to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And so we now Aaron should have known better than to do what he did. Amen. Moses is gone to get the Ten Commandments and tables of stone from God. And, and Aaron takes the golden ear, the earrings and makes a golden calf. Amen. And says, this is your God. After God had done so much, after the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day, after the tabernacle and all that they were seeing God do. Amen. They, and they do something like this. After God provided water for them, after God did everything that he did in delivering them at the, at the Red Sea, and and they still preacher you ever close to 40 years here you ever see people do stuff and say why how many of you members you look around and you've seen other members do stuff and you say why 
would they do something like that? The Bible says neither give place to the devil. Because if we give just a little crack in the gate, he's coming in. And when he comes in, amen, he's his roaring lion. He's, going to, he's seeking whom he may devour. And one of the first thing that the old devil will devour, Brother Jim, is our intellect. Our ability to make right decisions based on right discernment from the Holy Spirit. Because when we give place to the devil, the Holy Spirit's leadership and the Holy Spirit's conviction is not there like it was. And we need God's, God's discernment, amen, in how we walk and live our life day in and day out. Notice what Jeroboam did. Sin is always progressive. Jeroboam in, in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. Wherefore the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. Aaron just made one. Jeroboam now is making two. Notice what happens. And said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of... Now, behold, I mean, two different ones did it now. It was just one God doing it. Now it's two of them, two golden calves. And notice what he did in verse 29. And he said the one in Bethel, and he put the other in Dan. In other words, what he said... It's too inconvenient for you to have to go to church to worship. Can I meddle, preacher? <laughs> I love live streaming. Can I make your live stream crowd mad? <laughs> I'm not intentionally. But if you're physically able to be here, you are to be in the house of God. From the end of February, last February, four and a half months, I could not make it to the house of God. Going through lung issues and ended up COPD, thyroid taken out, and different things. Not, I'm not trying to get pity. I'm just trying to say, but when I could get back to the house of God, you can ask Debbie, our schedule's filled up, amen. <laughs> Four and a half months not being able to preach, Brother Jimmy, it's in me, amen. I didn't have the wind to do it, but I got wind now. God's giving me my breath back, amen. And too many people have used it for an excuse to lay out, amen. And, and so many people, we had a missionary that was in on furlough, and, and, and not one of ours, but from another mission board. And he said he'd run across an old friend. And he said as he got to talking to him, he didn't have a lot of time to deal with him or anything. But he said this old friend said, I, he, said, I, I, he said, I love live stream because during the COVID time, and that's when it all started up. He said, I like the, the live streaming because when we, the church is shut down and stuff, he said that we could still watch the service. And he said, I, we thought we had to be live stream. We had to be watching it while it was happening. He said, you know, we found out we could watch it anytime. He said, we had a boat that we hadn't used. He said, we found out we could be on the boat out on the lake and watch live stream. He said, we found out we could even watch it that night when we came in. Amen. When we couldn't do nothing else. Oh, church, when you can't do nothing else. He said he went as far as this. He said after a while, we got to realizing we're not in the church. We're not consuming their air conditioning, their heat, their utilities. We're not. He said, he told this missionary, he said, you know how much we're saving by not tithing now? I'm preaching on we need some discernment. And he was dead serious. You got people that haven't come back? Same mentality. Jeroboam made two. He said, we're going to make it convenient to worship. So you don't have to go out of your way to worship. Show me in the Word of God where worship is not to cost you. To serve Him, to worship Him in spirit truth to, to serve him with your whole heart it's going to cost you we're going to sacrifice time we're going to have to sacrifice our finances to have what we have to worship in amen you say but preacher we can stay home and watch it hey you can't stay home and watch it if somebody wasn't sacrificing for this <laughs> 
two calves. Convenient. That guy said, we, we, we would get up and put on our church clothes and sit and watch it on the... He said, then we found out we could just go get us a cup of coffee and sit in our pajamas and watch it. Real reverence for God. I used to say, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm old school. No, I'm not sorry. I'm old school. He deserves our best. Notice what Hosea did, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 16 and 17. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God. Then two calves and made a grove and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. Verse 17. And caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Sin always progresses. Our unfaithfulness, Brother Ron, our children, our grandchildren, and on down the line are going to reap if we're not faithful to serve Him. If we don't hold a standard high, if we don't hold the standard to we, we worship Him as He deserves to be worshipped. It says, come before His presence with singing. I dare say most people that watch live stream don't sing with the church. They don't sing with the congregation. They don't sit there. They just sit there and watch it and, and get up and then walk out and get a cup of coffee, walk out and use the bathroom, walk out. There's no reverence to it. While I couldn't be in church for that period of time, we had churches we knew across the time zone. We'd watch one service after another. You say, preacher, I'm not trying to portray that we're super spiritual. I'm just saying there's a, if you're real, there's a hunger for God in your life, for the things of God. There's got to be a determination to do right. This is the last point. This is where you'll understand the title. There's got to be a determination to do right. We see the discouragement. We see the destruction. We see the deliverance. We see the discernment that's needed. But look at this. We need a determination to do right. In 2 Kings chapter 18 and verses 1 through verse 5. I've run across this passage in my devotions, and all you Bible scholars may have seen this a long time ago, but this is what prompted this message. I've read that passage I don't know how many times, Brother Shockley. But one morning I read this just a few months back, and it leaped off the pages. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abiah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. Notice verse 4. He removed the high places, and broke the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpent. But Stanley, I had never, no, I've been saved 42 years now. And I had never given any thought to that brazen serpent after Moses erected it there in the wilderness. The children of Israel looked, they lived, they went on. It was still hanging around in Hezekiah's day. He break it in pieces. And he break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made for unto this part really gets me. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. 
But Jim, they were still burning incense to the brazen. It was never to have incense burned to it. They're burning incense to the brazen serpent. And he called it Nehushtan. Now, preacher, I know you know what that word is. I did, and I had to look it up. <laughs> it must have been a bunch of Baptists. It must have been a bunch of Baptists that Hezekiah was dealing with because he said, Nehushtan. He said, what does it mean? He's told, it's just brass. <laughs> It's just brass. No, no doubt they were getting upset because he's breaking in pieces the brazen serpent. Now my question is this. When the children of Israel, it was built for, that brazen serpent was for a time, for a place, for a certain circumstance. And when the children of Israel picked up the tabernacle and moved to the next location, I find no record where the serpents went with them. But they kept their brazen serpent, just in case. Just in case those critters hatch out of some of our suitcases or something, you know. And they started burning incense to it. Onto that day. Now, preacher, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, I, if that is right, that means from the time that it was erected, from the time that they carried it to the next spot, all the way through to that day. That means when Solomon built his temple. Yeah. That brazen serpent was present. When Ga David was gathering all the provisions for his son Solomon to build the temple, that brazen serpent was present. It was more than present. They're burning incense to it. When they dedicated the temple... And we read about the glory of Solomon's temple. My question is this, what could it have been had the brazen serpent been destroyed long before? What could Israel have been through all of their journeys? See, the, the brazen serpent came into being before they entered into Canaan land. What if, Brother Jim, they had destroyed the brazen serpent before they crossed Jordan? I don't think an enemy could have stood before him. You say, preacher, wait a minute. Now, God bless them. How many of y'all have had God bless you when you know you wasn't where you should have been? When we know we wasn't doing all that we should have been doing, God still has blessed us. But what could God do for us if we didn't have our brazen serpent? When Hezekiah destroyed it, notice what it says about him in verse 5. He trusted the, in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. That's even David. Why? Because he got rid of a brazen serpent. Because he got rid of something that was a stumbling block to the nation of Israel. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2, Wherefore seeing we also were compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And that sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3 says, For consider him 
that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself that she be wearied and faint in your minds. We're going to faint in our minds when we don't get rid of that weight, amen, when we don't get rid of that sin that so easily besets us, amen. It, we see it in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. It says, For I have de I've determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified, amen. Don't need a brazen serpent. Uh, the, the Ephesians 3 and verse 19, And to know the love of Christ, the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Philippians 3 and 10, That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable to His death. Deut excuse me, Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord uh, thy God, to walk in His ways, to love uh, and to love Him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Joshua said it this way, Choose you this day whom you will serve. If you won't make right choices with that brazen serpent, though, because that's divided loyalty. You can't serve two masters. You'll cleave to the one and hate the other. You'll, you'll, you'll cling to the one and despise the other. You can't serve two masters. The children of Israel are trying to serve that brazen serpent and serve God. Amen. What could God have done with Israel if they'd gotten rid of the brazen serpent? What could God do with you? For you and through you. If we'd get rid of our brazen serpents. You say, preacher, what do you mean get rid of our brazen serpents? I believe with all my heart Israel fought to maintain and preserve that brazen serpent. Just like they did the, the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> I believe they, they did everything they could to maintain, to hang on to it, to keep it, amen, to protect it. A month ago, Debbie and I celebrated 50 years. She got the gold pen and the certificate. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Survival. <laughs> I love that lady with all my heart. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I love him more. Because, preacher, I realize if my love for him isn't the most, my love for her can't be what it should be. We had eight years of marriage without him in our lives, in my life. The last 42 have been a whole lot sweeter because of him because he shows us how to love how sacrifice for how will don't don't misunderstand what i'm getting ready to say but if she says i'm walking out if you don't quit serving god I'm sorry. Because how can God help me to keep this if I forsake Him? You say, preacher, if you lose her, you've lost your ministry. I won't keep her by forsaking Him. Because if I forsake Him, I won't be what she needs. You say, preacher, what's a brazen serpent? Well, it's that thing that you, you'll sacrifice for it, but you won't sacrifice it. You work overtime to maintain it. But you won't deny the overtime to please him. You work the overtime to keep the boat, the car, the house. That's all things that perish. 
Wouldn't it be better to sacrifice the perishable to maintain the eternal? You won't sacrifice it, but you sacrifice for it. Why don't you lay it on the altar tonight? People sacrifice for their intellect, for their strength, for their health, for their talents, for their job, for the position, for the possessions, for their friends, for family. Once we lay those things on the altar, it's amazing how when we let him have the preeminent position, he blesses all others. I don't know the need in your heart and in your life tonight, but God does. And I believe with all my heart, preacher, I'm not saying your church is bad, that's not, but I believe there's a lot of brazen serpents in our churches. That people are bowing down, giving place to, giving preeminence to things instead of Him. If you would stand with me tonight, heads bowed and eyes closed. Preacher, if we could do it, maybe if you want to play a song, that'd be fine just to play a song. If I can do it this way. If God has spoken to your heart, would you come tonight? Would you come and would you let God do business in your heart? You say, preacher, if I, if I come forward after what you preach, people are going to know I've got a brazen serpent. Don't care. Don't be worried or concerned about what people might think. Be more concerned with what God knows in your life. Just put Him first. Just put Him first tonight. As she begins to play, would you come? Would you let God have His place in your life? Would you let God have it tonight? Would you give it to Him? Would you seek tonight to please Him more than yourself? Would you come? Hezekiah said, Nehushtan, it's just brass. It's not eternal. Well, Moses said he'd rather choose to suffer the, the afflictions of the people than enjoy sin for a season. That brazen serpent will bring pleasure for a season. But it'll wear down, it'll wear out. Preacher, you come. <laughs> Fathers, we heard the message tonight, not just a message from the lips of your servant, focused upon dividing the Word of God, but a message that you've spoken to my heart, and I pray to each and all who have come tonight, and some who've come here to the front to pray. Or may we lay it all on the altar, may we not keep a thing of brass, whatever that we value more than our relationship with you. We may not think that we do, but we keep those things around. A brazen serpent kept just as a, a memory maker or just as something of value of days gone past. But that day past, that serpent was there that if they were bitten, they may look and live. And today, we need the same to look and live. We need to believe upon your gift that you've sent. And Lord, we need not have other things creep in. Not lack discernment. We thank you for your deliverance. But be measured greatly that for God, to God be the glory that we'd have great determination. 
We ask and pray, Lord, that you receive our thanks for the message tonight, the message this morning, the songs, the fellowship, the smiles. Lord, it's been good today. And we thank you for it. We pray that you bless each and all who have come. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated just before we dismiss you in the name of the Lord. I'm going to do something different. Um, he mentioned that for 50 years that Miss Debbie has put up with him in a gold pit of I Survive. If you've brought some, maybe you got a $5 bill in you tonight, I'm going to ask a couple men to stand in the back and receive an offering for Debbie Keaton. Uh, she has put up with him for 50 years. Eight of them. That's one more than a tribulation. Eight of them when he didn't know Jesus. So if you have any money, you may not have but a dollar bill. You may have 50 cents. God will take it a little and he'll make it much if you got a 20. Whatever the Lord may lay upon your heart. And if she wants to share with him, we'll pray the Lord give her discernment. So we'll leave that up to the Lord how they do that. Whatever the Lord would have them do. But uh, just something in uh, 50 years. How many of you had a 50 year anniversary? How many of you? A few. 